Well, I want to extend a, a welcome and a good afternoon to all of you who've joined us on this Google Hangout. It's a pleasure to talk with you about the Richmond MBA over the next 30 minutes. I'm Richard Coghlan. I'm the director of the MBA program here at the University of Richmond, and I'm joined by two of our current students, so please al allow me to have them introduce themselves. We'll begin with Julianne. Hi there. My name is Julianne Akins. Uh, I'm in my third and final year of the program, started uh, three years ago. Uh, I did my undergrad at uh, Ohio State in music performance, and uh, I'm currently working for the Richmond Symphony. Julianne, thank you. I'm now I'm going to ask Sean to uh, introduce himself. Hi, my name is Sean Belaski, and I'm finishing up the program here in May, and I'm vice president of the Leadership Council, and uh, started last August, so I was able to breeze through the program, uh, relatively speaking, in two years. And um, my background, I've done sports media for the last five years and actually used the program to transition into a new career in investment banking. And I start with BB&T Capital Markets in July. Thanks to both of you for joining us. I know there will be questions that arise so that you may be better equipped to answer them than I would be. And let me encourage all of those who have joined us as viewers to uh, submit their questions through the Q&A here online. Uh, we have a few questions already, so let me get to those. The first one that I'm going to address is the one about the admissions process. We are currently building a class for the fall semester, that is students who will start in August, and the deadline for those of you interested uh, would be May 18th. And by May 18th, what we're asking for you to submit is the application, which you can find online and submit online. We'd also need a resume uh, from you so that we can examine your work experience to date. We do require you to submit either a GMAT or a GRE. Uh, those scores can be sent directly to us here at the university. And then, of course, we'll need your transcripts. Uh, for those of you that have completed an undergraduate degree, uh, if it's just at one institution, that's a pretty simple process. If you took classes at multiple institutions, we are going to ask that you send transcripts from all of those places. And if you have taken some graduate courses, we'd like to see uh, th those transcripts as well. There are some occasions, depending on where and when you took your graduate degree, that you might be able to have some of those classes count uh, toward your transfer. But May 18th is the important deadline. For many of our applicants that we're talking to most recently, the big hurdle is uh, just taking that, that GMAT or GRE. So you'd want to get that scheduled, and we can be helpful uh, to you on that. MBA.com is a wonderful resource for more information about the GMAT, which is the exam that most of our applicants take. We have a second question about when classes meet and the, the times that those classes meet. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to turn to Sean now uh, to talk a little bit about how the classes, uh, when they meet and how they go. So, Sean, if you'll pick up from here, I'd appreciate it. Sure, yeah. Classes uh, or evening classes, um, obviously this is a program that's designed so that you can work while you are getting your MBA. And so uh, we have our core classes, kind of the... Um, the classes that you have to take that are 14 weeks, and those go from 6.15 at night to 8.55, and so those are, I guess, two hours and 40 minutes. And then we have other classes that are, are just seven-week classes, and those actually meet for a little bit longer, so that's 6.15 until 9.45. And each class you meet once a week uh, outside of the summer. If you take summer session class and it's 14 weeks, then you meet twice a week. But each class you meet once a week. And for the 14-week classes, which are three credits, then that is um, two hours and 40 minutes. The seven-credit classes are, are three hours and, and 30 minutes. And the professors do a, a pretty good job of, of giving you breaks kind of here and there. So you'll go, you know, for about an hour. Then you take about a 10, 15-minute break. Eat at Lou's, which is right there in the business school, a place where you can go get something to eat. And uh, then you pick back up for about another hour. And the, the seven-week classes, they typically will probably give you two breaks as well. So they're good about doing that. Sean, thank you for that description. Uh, we do have eight three-credit courses, eight two-credit courses, and then there are five one-credit courses that make up the curriculum. And as Sean did a really nice job of outlining, the three-credit courses run the full semester, and the uh, two-credit courses run for just half a semester. A typical load in the Richmond MBA is about seven or eight credits per semester. For those who want to move through the program at the most rapid pace, that would have you done in 24 months. I'm now going to turn to Julianne to say a few words about her classmates, uh, what it's like to be in class, about the backgrounds of those that she's been studying with for the last few years. Julianne? Sure. Um, I think that I've noticed in this program the classmates have made all the difference. I think the, the, the professors are wonderful, of course, but you learn a lot because of the structure where you're um, discussion-based. So I, I think the diverse backgrounds that everybody brings to the table is 
uh, is really nice. It's not so much a lecture format, it's more, more involved. Um, so we've seen, um, obviously, financial industries uh, and uh, operations, plenty of representatives from Altria, Capital One, and uh, Genworth, but um, I'm, I'm from the Symphony, a nonprofit uh, organization, so contributing that as well. So it's, um, it's been great. I think that's, again, that's made the difference for me in the program is the classmates. Julianne, thanks very much for that, that description. Uh, so we have one other uh, question already, and I'm going to encourage anybody who's viewing now and has a question, please go ahead and submit it by, via the Q&A uh, feature here on the, the Google Hangout. The next question I want to respond to is about scholarship opportunities uh, for students coming into the program. So there are a couple of opportunities now uh, thanks to uh, one. The first one is thanks to our MBA alumni who have been really, really generous and created a fund, a scholarship fund, that allows us to provide support to one student at a time as they make their way through the program. It is not a full scholarship, but it does help close the gap between what your company might provide in terms of tuition support and the total cost of the tuition. So we're now able to support one student through the one scholarship fund. Roughly a third of their tuition is paid for uh, by that fund, and typically, as they make their way through the program, say for every three credit course they take, we may be able to uh, to absorb the cost of one of those thanks to the generosity of our our alumni. We have also established a second program uh, that allows us to fund maybe three or four more students at a similar level. That is, roughly 20 to 25 percent of their tuition may be covered through a program we've developed uh, just recently that helps especially those who have very little support from their company come through the program. Again, the company may provide some support, the student may uh, pay for some of the tuition, and then the MBA program in the university paying for 20 to 25 percent. Like more details on that, I'm more than happy to uh, set up a time to, to meet with you or to, to get on the phone and, and talk through that as well. Ah, we have a great question about international opportunities, and uh, I'm going to turn to the students who are here to have them describe firsthand some of the international opportunities that exist in the program. Julianne, I'll start with you. Sure. Uh, as part of my international residency, I went to Ecuador last uh, last spring break for one week. So the international residency is the is the middle um, tier of the program, and uh, students, I guess, for for one week were there, but the whole um, the semester-long course prepares you for that. You do um, cultural research, um, industry research um, in that country or city, so uh, you're prepared to, to go in and actually consult with the firm in, in that country. So uh, once we were in, e in Ecuador, we met with, um, met with a company and assessed their strategic problem and came back and prepared a full uh, recommendation to them. And uh, so that was wonderful, just getting to, to know the country a little bit and their customs. Um, that's part of the inter international residency. I'm actually taking advantage of, hopefully taking advantage of, one of the, um, the sister schools that University of Richmond has uh, partnered with in Vienna, Austria this summer. So they have um, what I understand to be condensed electives. So uh, for me, I believe it's a three-week program, uh, hoping to make that work. And uh, you, it's an international program, so I'll be studying with business students from around the world, um, and for a number of different, a num number of different electives. I think strategic and marketing focused is the session I'm looking to to go to, uh, but they build in cultural touring and events around that. So, really wonderful opportunities. I don't think I would take advantage of otherwise. So, um, looking forward to that. And the opportunity that Julianne just describes is one of many uh, that come up for our students each summer. There are a handful of places where we send our MBA students if they can uh, afford the time away from work for two or three weeks. They can study at fine institutions around the world side by side with terrific uh, MBA students, master students from, from so many other places. Sean, I'm going to turn to you to talk both about international opportunities and then if you don't mind putting the international residency in the context of the other pillars of the program. Maybe say a word, if you don't mind, about the opening residency, international residency, and then the capstone project. Those are the three pillars of our curriculum as we describe them. Sean? Certainly, yeah. The um, And I just did my international residency, I guess, a few weeks ago. Just got back from Ecuador as well. And um, yeah, like Dr. Coughlin said, there are three kind of requirements and three kind of big big parts of the program and the first is the opening residency and that's what you'll do 
kind of first off, I guess unless you start in January, then you'll have a semester under your belt, then you'll do it in August, and you go to the Jefferson, and you spend a week in there, and you're working with a company, and you're doing this, um, you're working on a project, kind of a consultancy project, and you're working in teams, and you're kind of just, you're really just thrown in the deep end, and it's really kind of a, a cool experience, because um, it, it kind of gives you a, a cool overview about what the program's all about, and you get kind of a glimpse of, you know, you get a glimpse of marketing, you get a glimpse of uh, the consulting process, you get a glimpse of uh, pretty much everything that you're going to go in depth in, in uh, dur throughout this program. And then you just kind of, um, you just dive right in and you work with your classmates and it forces you to kind of uh, intimately work with, with two or three of, of your new classmates. And you're, you're there um, pretty much, you know, uh, throughout the week just putting together this, this presentation. And then there's a, there's a cool element of competition to it as well. You know, you're, you want to, you want to do your best, you want to put on for, for this company and you want to make the best first impression on your classmates as well as on your professors. And so that's a really, really cool, um, cool thing that the University of Richmond MBA does. And then the international residency, um, just on that, that was one of the big selling points when I was uh, deciding whether, um, where I was going to go to school. And when Dr. Coughlin told me that this was, it wasn't just a, an option or something you could do, but it was a requirement. Because if you read a lot of the things, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out how to do business in a global economy. And you, you know, you, you can't, you can only do so much in a classroom. And so this forces you to actually get out there go into a different culture, learn about a new business culture, and um, and that's really, really valuable. And then the uh, the capstone, I'm, I'm in the middle of my capstone right now, I have my first presentation actually a week from yesterday, so I'm kind of kind of uh, really, really uh, working hard on that. But it's uh, it, it kind of brings everything back around. You know, the opening residency, you're doing this consultancy project, you're doing it with teams, and then the capstone is is a consultancy project in and of itself, and so then you take everything that you've learned throughout the two, three, four years, however, however uh, long you've been in the program, and then you just kind of wrap it all up and just put it into this presentation and present to a to a company and to a, on a project that's uniquely yours. So those are the kind of the, the three pillars, like Dr. Coglin said, and uh, and yeah, I'm in the middle of the capstone right now, so uh, <laughs> I'm I'm really up. I've been pulling some late nights lately. Sean, thank you. Uh, you can hear in Sean's stories the heavy reliance that the Robbins, the Robbins School and the Richmond MBA have on the business community that surrounds us. Of course, every one of the capstone projects that our students do, uh, and they've done more than 500 over the last dozen years, every one of those takes place really in uh, an area organization, some nonprofits, some small businesses, and then large companies as well. But one of the really important features of the Robbins MBA is just how embedded we are in the business community uh, across the region. And it provides tremendous opportunities for students both inside the classroom and then outside the classroom as well. I should let you know that the case study for this August has been established. We know who the company will be. Uh, for those that are based in Richmond, you may have heard about Ledbury, the shirt maker, uh, the fine shirt maker here in town. It's doing uh, wonderfully well. We have done a number of capstone projects our, our students have over the years as Ledbury has grown, but they've reached a point now where it makes sense for us to, to look inside Ledbury uh, as the opening residency case study. So for those that will join the student body uh, this fall, uh, they will be tackling a case that Ledbury provided where we have a faculty member right now working on that case study, writing the case study, and that'll be sent to the new cohort sometime in July uh, for, for further study. So question about professional opportunities outside the classroom, and I may here turn to Julianne, who's done a great job with the MBA Women's Association to create opportunities, but also, Julianne, if you don't mind talking about some of the opportunities created by the Robin School uh, that our students might take advantage outside of class. Sure. Um, I, I made myself start to go to these. I, th I think my second year around, the, the first semester just was, was so intense, but I, I would encourage you to take advantage of these opportunities as much as you can. Um, they do a wonderful job of supplementing the classwork by, um, by connecting the full community in Richmond, uh, the business community. So the career management series um, is one that I try and participate in pretty heavily. Those are um, professional themed uh, seminars just for MBA students, I believe for current MBA students. Um, and we just did one on, we had an etiquette dinner that we just went to. Um, there was a panel on professionalism that we, we went to. Um, anything from building your personal brand to um, completing a resume, your, your portfolio, all of that stuff. So it's, it's really nice to have those tools available to you and they bring in 
um, different community leaders to, to run those sessions. Um, another popular one is the, the C-suite series where uh, Dr. Coughlin or Dean Begranoff will uh, interview some of the, the business leaders who have either come through the Richmond program or have um, an interesting presence in Richmond. So uh, those are either in the mornings or in the evenings, I believe. I think they're, they're called something different, but um, those are wonderful just to, to get a real uh, off-the-cuff perspective from some of the, the CEOs in, in town and uh, nationally. So uh, those are those are really great. Um, and then uh, we have the MBA Leadership Council. Um, Sean's a member of that and the Women's Association. And uh, we've done a lot to put together some programming to, to complement the social factor, um, add something to the, to the program that way. So we have uh, social events uh, and then uh, some career-themed events as well. Um, so the social events, we have those, um, uh, I believe we have uh, happy hours every, one, one Friday every month. Um, we've been doing those this year. Uh, the women, we took a trip to some of the wineries in Virginia and met with a, um, a female winemaker. Uh, Dr. Coughlin led a women's only um, negotiation session for us, which was great. And uh, we have a women's networking event coming up, and we're very excited to have our first annual uh, spring soiree, so sort of a, um, a chance to celebrate the end of the semester together in a more relaxed setting. Um, and so we're, we're really trying to, to, to beef up on the, the relationship between the alumni and uh, current students, but there's some, there's some wonderful programming out there available. Julianne, thank you. I'm going to allow Sean to say a word or two about the activities of the Leadership Council. He's an officer there and uh, has really been instrumental in building some of the programs. Sean, maybe one or two of the events you've had this year that Julianne did not mention yet. Yeah, so we, uh, like Julianne mentioned, yeah, we do a we do a happy hour every first uh, the first Friday of every of every month, and just kind of um, you know just ways to better uh, know your classmates outside. Of uh, outside the classroom and kind of building relationships that way, and then coming up, uh, coming up this Friday, we're actually Dean Begranoff has actually opened up her house, and we're going to be going over there this Friday evening, and she is, um, you know, very excited and very welcoming. I mean, it's amazing how I mean she was very eager and she was very eager to offer, you know, her house for us to come over, and so we we're about 40 of us I think are descending upon her house on Friday night. So that should be a lot of fun. And like um, like Julianne mentioned, we're, we're the big event that we're doing is the spring soiree that's coming up here uh, in about a month or so. And we're um, just kind of uh, I don't know if Dr. Coughlin has mentioned, but the one of the big events uh, there's the opening residency obviously, but then there's the Christmas party. And the Christmas party every December is when all the alumni come back to the Jefferson um, for a night and. Um, you know, you, you can really network and kind of connect those ways, but it's, uh, you know, and I found too, you know, like Julianne mentioned about the alumni, um, you know, whether whether it's a an undergrad graduate of Richmond, an MBA graduate of Richmond, I think people, the, the Richmond alumni base is very proud of their of their connection, and, and every time, you know, uh, Dr. Coughlin's put me in touch with someone who's a Richmond alum, um, you kind of instantly, they kind of instantly just want to kind of welcome you and say hello and, and just kind of uh, establish a relationship and that's been really neat to experience here these last couple of years. Sean, thank you. One of the aspects that we've not covered yet that I'd like uh, the two of you to talk about are the faculty members and the backgrounds that they bring uh, into the classroom. So Julianne, I'm going to ask you first, maybe tell a story about one or two uh, professors that you gain a great deal from, especially in terms of their own backgrounds and what they bring. Uh, sure. Well, I I would start um, by saying the faculty is is wonderful here. It's it's made the difference for me. Um, the the core faculty in particular, I, I'll just tell a story about one of my favorites is Professor Bossy, who teaches strategy, um, and his ability to really um, push past uh, your initial response. So if you're answering a question, you think you have it right, and you've you've thought this out forwards and backwards, he'll encourage you to to dig past. Um, so you're, you you have to think seven or eight steps where you know you're really working your brain that way. So, um, and he does a really great job of balancing that in, in an environment that's just the right balance of intimidating and um, uh, where you feel comfortable and encouraged to participate as well. So uh, that's been that was probably one of my favorite courses. I really enjoyed negotiations with Dr. Coughlin as well. Um, and then I would say overall the the faculty has really the perfect balance of the the business uh, professional experience background to bring to the table. 
uh, and combined with their, their research skills on the academic side. So uh, it's been a nice balance there and uh, with the, especially with some of the, the electives, that's where you can kind of bring in um, some of the some of community members who are just just there to uh, to teach their expertise. I took a, a class in storytelling um, last fall with uh, Tracy Tracy Doherty, which was really great to have um, that that unique opportunity. I don't, I don't know if that that will come up again. So it's um, it's really great at balancing the the core classes with the um, some of our electives are more in the moment and relevant to business today. So it's it's a nice balance that way. Julianne, thank you. Sean, you arrived in the program with a particular eye on finance. It was not something in your background. Can you talk a bit about how you worked with finance faculty, but also how you found opportunities outside the classroom to boost your own knowledge of finance and position you to land the position you did at, uh, at bb and Capital Markets? Certainly, yeah. And it really, um, my real fascination with finance came with uh, John Earl's class and John Earl is one of the smartest people I, I just I've ever met I mean this guy could teach corporate finance just with his eyes closed I mean he just goes to the board and he just knows everything everything about finance I mean it's pretty pretty unbelievable and he has this amazing Boston accent which is neither here nor there but anyway um, no but John Earl really his class got me interested in going down the path that I'm going down, and really the two the two professors, you know, it was John Earl, and then it was Jonathan Whitaker who teaches operations, and those probably were the two toughest classes that I've taken in the program. But the, obviously, you know, the, those are the classes that you get the most out of, and they really challenge you, and they are uh, they're there to help if if you're willing to ask for it. And like Dr. Coglin said, you know, just kind of pursuing things on my own. I, I participated in the um, what's called the ACG Cup. It's a mergers and acquisitions case competition. And really when I came into the program, I just said I was going to say yes to everything. If someone asked me to do something, I'd just say yes. And someone asked me, that, hey, do you, you want to do this M&A case competition? I knew nothing about mergers and acquisitions, knew nothing about financial modeling, and I just said, sure, why not? And uh, Dr. Earl was very, he was very helpful with, uh, with us throughout that process. Um, and we just put together this this case, and I was just so fascinated by by M and A, and I just started to pursue um, this investment banking career. And through people that Dr. Coglin was able to introduce me to, through um, you know, kind of pursuing some different things um, within the program, outside the program, talking to as many people as I could, um, it allowed me to to make a career transition. That honestly, two years ago, I would have said you're crazy if, if you said that I was going to be doing this. And so um, that that's been uh, certainly invaluable to me uh, in my career as I, as I get ready to start a new one here in a couple months. And Sean and Julianne will soon join the more than 1,200 alumni of the Richmond MBA who are still in the Richmond region. They've, each of them has talked about the fact that the alumni are very involved in the program as guest speakers. We have a mentoring program that pairs many of our current students with former students uh, who are serving as mentors. Uh, and then as Sean just described, many of them want to network and want to see how they can be helpful. Uh, so the network of alumni is another very, very strong feature of the Richmond MBA. We have about six or seven minutes left, and I'll encourage our viewers to continue asking uh, the great questions that you have. We have one about uh, what if you need more than two years to complete the program, so let me address that uh, right now. Our program has great flexibility. Uh, we, we do now have an option for students to complete the degree in 24 months, and that requires those students to be on campus for class two nights a week uh, over a 24-month period, including summers. But we also understand that for some people, 24 months is a bit too rapid. That there are other things going on in their lives and careers, and they may want to stretch the time in the program to three years or, say, four years. Because ours is not a lockstep program, there's great flexibility there are certainly prerequisites in the curriculum, uh, a sequence of courses you'll have to follow, but we don't specify that you take certain courses in the fall of your first year and certain other courses in the spring uh, of that first year. Uh, we will allow you to go at the pace that is comfortable uh, to you, and so some students will move along at kind of one class per semester or maybe one class per semester and then two classes the following semester. That's just fine. All students have up to five years to finish the degree. Uh, but they go at different paces. It now appears about 60% of our students will finish, those of whom came in in the fall of 2013, about 60% of them will finish uh, in that 24-month time frame, but that means 40% are moving uh, at, a, at a slightly different pace. 
I also want to talk a little bit about the, the time between here and, and uh, some of the deadlines that arise. Let me remind those who've just joined, we have a deadline in the middle of May for those that want to start in August. But if your aim is to start in January, we have that intake as well, and you just need to move your materials to us uh, between now and, and November. So there's a bit of extra time for those that want to start uh, in January. We will be hosting an on-campus information session uh, here in one of the classrooms in the Robbins School uh, a bit later in April, and I will encourage our viewers to check the uh, website uh, of the Robbins School and the MBA program for further details. We typically run those at 5.30 in the evening for about 45 minutes or an hour, give you a chance to meet some of the staff, uh, also some of the current students, and hear a bit more uh, about the, the MBA program. We've gotten a couple of questions just in the last minute or two. L let me uh, address the one about coming to campus to visit a class or meet with uh, the faculty or the administration. One of the things that I always encourage prospective MBA students to do is to find their way into a classroom while a class is going on. And so we extend that invitation to any prospective student. Our preference is to meet with you first, get a sense of what you're looking for. But following that, we will extend uh, to you a class listing and encourage you to find a night that might be uh, work for you to visit a classroom. And we will arrange that. We want to make sure the professor is not giving a midterm or doing something else that night. But with a little bit of notice, we can allow you to participate in a class just as though you were an MBA student. And of course, we run classes in the spring. We run classes in the summer. Uh, so we can make those arrangements. And I know Sean and Julianne and their classmates have grown used to prospective students joining the classroom environment. But this is a really important step, I think, to get a feel for any MBA program. And we want to be as transparent as we can be about what it's like to be an MBA student here. So I would encourage you to take advantage of that. We also strongly encourage students, as I said, to pop into the MBA office to set an appointment, and that would allow you to meet with all of us who are involved in the MBA program. It's really a tight-knit community here. We want to get to know the MBA students before they enter the program, while they're in the program, and stay in touch uh, afterwards as well. I have a question about typical class size. Uh, maybe I'll allow the students to talk a bit about what, what they've encountered, both in terms of the core classes and then maybe some of the electives, like the storytelling elective that Julianne described. So Julianne, what uh, typical class size would like to do? Sure. Uh, I would say for the core classes, it's anywhere from 9 to, to 21 on a very full class. Uh, that's probably the largest I've seen. Um, I'm in an elective now. It's market research. I'm one of four students, so that's wonderful. It's, it's customized to what I need for my capstone, which is great. Um, but it's in general, it's a it's a pretty intimate class, and you get to know each other very well. Um, so it's 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 just the right size for me. And our focus here is not on growth in terms of size. Uh, for those of you who have spent time on our campus or talking with students or professors or alumni, you I hope appreciate the fact that we're really focused on excellence. And so we are very comfortable with the size of the student body, with the size of the classes that we're offering. Uh, today, and as Julianne said, uh, almost everything we do is done on a small basis. When you come into the opening residency, you might be among 35 other classmates, but following that, it's much more typical that you're in a class uh, with 12 to 15 or sometimes 20 other students as you make your way uh, through the program. And of course, when you get into the electives, some of those are really run in a seminar fashion. No matter what class you're in, you're going to be encouraged to participate, but obviously those electives give us an opportunity to really draw the experiences uh, out of our students. And there's a question about the experience of our students, so I'll tackle that one right now. An average uh, applicant, successful applicant into the Richmond MBA would have five or six years of, of work experience before coming into the program. We do uh, require that everyone have uh, two years of, a minimum of two years of work experience. I often say to prospective students, we, we like you to be managing budgets or managing people or managing projects, something that gives you a management uh, feel even before you enter the program. That's really where we pitch uh, the MBA program and the discussion as far as that goes. The diversity of experiences is, is tremendous, from Sean's experience in sports media to Julianne's work with the symphony. Of course, we have folks from professional services, from manufacturing and from a variety of, of different backgrounds. About a third of our students study business as undergrads, another third study engineering uh, during their undergraduate days, and then a third study a variety of disciplines other than business 
or, or engineering. So it's really a diverse set of experiences and our faculty are keen on calling those experiences out in the classroom discussion. Well, it's 12.30, and so I want to bring this online Q&A session to an end and thank all of you who tuned in to, to view it. We hope you'll be in touch with us uh, here in the MBA program. Uh, feel free to call us or email us. I'll encourage you to continue to check the website for updates on the MBA program. Check out the Facebook page for great stories on what our students and alumni are doing, and let us know how, we, how else we can be helpful to you as you make your way toward applying to the Richmond MBA. Thank you very much. We'll look forward to hearing from you. Julianne and Sean, I appreciate each of you spending uh, part of your lunch hour with us uh, promoting the, the Richmond MBA. Thank you both. Happy to. Thank you. All right. Have a great day, everyone.